Evart Street in Northeast DC is an older, well-kept community. Bungalows mixed in with post-war single-family homes, sidewalks. It's quiet here, almost peaceful. The corner lot where Lou Edna Jones's house sat is now empty. All that's left are the concrete steps that make their way up to the once grassy lot from the sidewalk. The house was huge. And my parents actually bought that house in that location because growing up, I wanted an electric train. And there was no place where we lived to put the electric train. You had to put it down every day and take it up every day. They bought that house for the basement so I could have some place for my toys. This is Eddie Jones, Lou Edna's son. His family bought the double-story White House when he was eight years old. Growing up there, it was enjoyable. It was quite enjoyable. Yeah. You could actually go outside. Didn't have to worry about getting well. All these gunshots and things were here lately. Yeah. But you could go outside. You could um, just enjoy your life. This is Arson. I'm Cara McGurk Allison. Luetna Jones was killed on June 5th, 2003. She was upstairs in her bedroom as the serial arsonist placed an incendiary device on a green mat by her front door while she slept. My mom would bend over backwards for you, a stranger, uh, someone that she'd known most of her life. She, um, she was an outgoing person. She just didn't have, she just didn't meet people that she didn't like. Jones, known as Mama Lou to family and friends, was the matriarch of the neighborhood. Kids would run to help her bring groceries into the house. She'd invite you in for dinner if you passed by while she was grilling in the yard. The home was the cornerstone of the community until that horrible early morning in June. At four something in the morning, my telephone at home rang. I was in uniform, almost getting really had my hand on the door, getting ready to go out the door to go to work. Well, one of the young ladies who lives next door to us called and said that my mother's house was on fire. Oh. Where I did... said to her, I was on my way. I don't remember yeah. anything else after that. Yeah. Other than the fact I went out, got in my truck, and the next thing I know, I was standing on the York Street. What was happening by the time you got there? Something I would never want to see again. I stood outside the fence on 28th Street and watched that house burn. I'm so sorry. I stood there and looked at the burn through my mother's bedroom. I didn't know whether she was in there or not. There was no way for me to get in because every move I make, the police would get between me and the fence. Um, I stood there on that street and I guess I cried like I was two years old. At this point, the task force is frustrated because the evidence so far hasn't led to an arrest. The eyewitnesses, the tracing of the convenience store bags, surveillance videos, DNA, but the DC serial arsonist is still lighting fires. The sick truth is that the task force needs more fires to catch him. More burning homes means more evidence, but the death of Mama Lou is fresh in their minds. They just hope every day that no one else is hurt. They've come to a point where they have to try something new because tips are slowing down. Sometimes the work is mundane, even tedious. They had the same routine each day, Tom Daly. First thing in the morning, we would we would have an in brief. Was there another fire? Was there a different suspect we might have talked to or taken a DNA sample from or whatever? Um, and we would discuss those things. And quite often, um, I would run the overnight surveillance. So I might go to the morning briefing or show up at the morning briefing after having worked all night. So we might work 11 p to 7 a, and then we'd have an in brief at 8 a.m. 
then I go to the in brief and then go home and go to bed and then be back in the next night for surveillance. So that, that happened a lot, depending upon what was going on. Long, grueling hours repeated day after day. The frustrating part of all this is how it seems the arsonist is managing to stay one step ahead of the team. And to compound any self-doubt, a local television news station reporter was providing overly detailed information to the public about the case. This is one of the toughest parts of an investigation, a love-hate relationship with the media, which is complicated at best. On one hand, they don't want the press to reveal certain details about the investigation. That might derail any progress or inform potential copycat criminals. So stuff like a message left behind or revealing property damage done by the arsonist, specifics about the incendiary device components or construction, names of people of interest. ATF's Scott Fulkerson. We had some concerns early on about investigative information that was being provided to the media, um, unbeknownst to the investigative core team, which was a extraordinary challenge for us to overcome. Because as you can imagine, by providing information to the public, we are now, um, and in particular, there was a Will Thomas video, uh, I believe it was a, a Fox 5 video, if I recall. This fire starter has struck again the second time in just two days, and tonight, Fox 5 has uncovered the type of person investigators believe they have on their hands. The MO, the uh, same But the news piece a, uh, had basically um, had a, a burned, occupied, single-family home post setting fire that Will Thomas had uh, done a video piece outside of. Fox Will Thomas is live in Northeast with this exclusive report. Will. Tracy, my source is telling me investigators are confident this was the work of the serial arsonist based on the time about three o'clock in the morning. And he had in his possession one of those one gallon plastic jugs with gasoline, a cloth wick. And he mentioned multiple times in his news piece that sources close to the investigation have informed him. Sources close to the investigation say this is how the fires are ignited each time. A plastic jug like this filled with gasoline. A wick of some kind is threaded through the top and lit. The that this is the type of device that was being utilized by the serial arsonist and sources close to the investigation had provided him with characteristics of the serial arsonist in which they were the arson task force was currently looking for. Um, sources, sources close to the investigation would provide him with additional details. And the challenge that we had as a task force was that now that that information is out to the public, we had a very difficult time being able to have an absolute 100% certainty that if somebody were to utilize a similar device, that we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a copycat or that of the serial arsonist. In fact, at one point, the team thought they may have found the arsonist, but he turned out to be a copycat. Well, we, we do believe Mr. Paul Dubois um, was, was somebody who had done his research on what was occurring in and around um, the District of Columbia and Prince George's County mm. by um, the arsonist. And a similar device was being utilized um, or was utilized in the apartment complex fire that he had set. Um, in the District of Columbia. That's what's so terrifying about the news media showing the, the general public what was used, right? Because even if, I mean, you don't know if Paul Dubois found that on the media or if he was doing his own research sure. or, but right? I mean, it's just out there for sure. general knowledge. So how do you control that kind of like information from? It's extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. And you can imagine, Kara, now we also had a level of distrust within the, within the task force itself. Right. The task force is left wondering if the arsonist could be someone closer to home, or if a person on the team is leaking detailed information to the press. It becomes obvious that they need to move out of their highly visible office at Prince George's County Fire. Because we don't, we don't know if it's somebody amongst us who was releasing the information or how that information was being, was being released. So for those two reasons, luckily and thankfully, we had the support of our ATF management to 
to shoulder that load and to support us with providing us with uh, office space in our very remote area in Prince George's County um, where the media um, did not have access to and it was exclusive to those members of the task force. Controlling information turns out to be one of the most challenging and debilitating aspects of this arson investigation. The media leaks were a huge cause of concern, fueling distrust among the task force members. And confidentiality is, it, it, you got to have it. I, I know in, in fire departments, people talk and they guess and they speculate. And, you know, there would have been a constant barrage uh, of folks coming to people involved in the investigation. Hey, what are you doing? What do you know? What can you tell me? Or just the, the fishing expedition where, you know, someone would say, well, I heard. Or, Did you guys know? Or had you guys heard about? And in some cases, people may, may be guessing and guessing near right. But what, what we were seeing was, no, it, it was making it unmanageable. Something had to be done. This is Ron Blackwell. Early on in the investigation, he was chief at Prince George's County Fire and worked closely with Mark Brady, the spokesperson, or PIO. It was a crazy time. And uh, so Mark came to me one afternoon and said, hey, chief, we've got an interview for you with Whoop Blitzer tonight. <laughs> that was my reaction, too. What? <laughs> Wolf Blitzer? He goes, yeah, we're, we're yeah, we're, we're going to go downtown and, and you're going to talk to Wolf Blitzer about the fires. And I'm like, great. Uh, and uh, during the, the interview, I thought that, you know, it was going well. And we get near the end and he asked something along the lines of, well, Chief, uh, these fires are happening in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Why is that? <laughs> I, I had not prepared for that. And so, you know, I said something along the lines of, well, you know, there are a lot of uh, African-American and minority people who live in these neighborhoods and then went back to what the message was. Folks, be vigilant. And if you see something, say something, you know, that, that whole line, line of conversation. And it was over. Uh, and as we're leaving, Victor Sagnero, his cell phone rings. We walk ahead, he catches up, and he says, uh, I've got Teresa Stoop from ATF on the phone. She needs to talk to you. And now I'm thinking, well, did I say something wrong? <laughs> Get on the phone, and she could not have been nicer. She said, hey, um, just saw your interview. I'm sorry I hadn't gotten a hold of you sooner. You know, I've had some knowledge of those fires and I'd like to meet with you uh, tomorrow morning to talk about next steps. Teresa Stoop led the ATF task force. And I had uh, seen Chief Blackwell that day on the news. So Prince George's County, I picked up the phone and called him and I said, Chief, I think we need to have a meeting because I could already see what the, the kind of activity that surrounded it. I had worked cases like this before there was going to be a, a formal um, process that needed to happen. And this is how Ron Blackwell became the face of the DC arson investigation. And it's a tenuous relationship with the media. The task force needs the press to keep the story alive so that neighborhoods are vigilant and observing and calling in tips, but... There were things that we knew and uh, people involved in the investigation would know, but that the public should not know. And then we'd hear things. And I think I'd shared with you the, uh, the Will Thomas story, new story that, that he did at Fox 5, where, where he just laid it out. Hey, he's got a jug and it's got a wick and he puts it on the porch. And it's like, damn it, man, what, what are you doing? And uh, we were, were, were quite upset about that. Uh, and there was a lot of, hey, did you see it? Did, did you see Fox last night? And I reached out to, uh, to Fox and talked to, I believe, a, the news manager. It was a woman. Uh, and it expressed our displeasure with uh, uh, the way it, it had been handled. And we didn't, didn't see Will Thomas again. 
which I thought was nice. But we still had our internal struggles with protecting information. Because as you can imagine, uh, sources and methods are a big deal. But yeah, that that, that confidentiality question uh, and and leaking that that was not a pleasant period. Will Thomas was a reporter for Fox 5 News in D.C. at the time of the investigation. My sources were involved at the very highest levels of the investigation, so therefore would have been part of the task force. Will says his sources assured him and his editorial team that the exclusive information shared with the viewers would not impede the investigation. Well, we knew that the information was not out there, but when you are dealing with people in law enforcement, whether it was fire or police, you know when they're giving you information that they are professionals and they know what they're doing or certainly hope so. This was not a situation where I learned of these details from, say, a victim or something, and then I put them on the spot and they felt compelled to confirm or deny. This was a situation where it was new information, new information to us, and our editorial team at Fox 5 made the decision that we would go ahead and do this. Will reminds me that television is a visual medium, different than radio or even print. And so showing a milk jug, uh, explaining to people how it may have looked was just part of the storytelling. And I'm sorry that some of the investigators um, didn't like it or were critical of it. Our intention was never to, of course, impede the investigation. And our sources really were very clear with us that this was not the kind of reporting that would hurt the investigation at all, that there were so many additional pieces of evidence, specific details about how these arsons were taking place that my broad stroke reporting of a milk jug and a wick and a flammable material was was not at all going to endanger the investigation. And what I would say to listeners is, you know, working in the Washington, D.C. market for 20 years and then before that working in the Austin, Texas market and Albuquerque market, is we've always felt as journalists and the people that I work with and the people I stood shoulder to shoulder with at press conferences is we wanted to try to help and and be valued in the community. In some cases, doing that is you're a watchdog, you're holding officials accountable. That's part of our job. In other cases, especially serial crimes, you're trying to get bits and pieces of information out there so that the good guys can catch the bad guys. And yes, it's competitive, and yes, you want to try to get an exclusive when appropriate, but truly, I can tell you from my personal perspective, the the editorial and management staff at Fox 5, and even my colleagues in the field, we all wanted to see this guy caught because we would interview these victims, and we, we, we knew how terrified people were. Task Force leader Teresa Stoop says the media was very supportive during the investigation. Media can be a powerful tool, used for offering a reward for specific information, deliver facts to the public to help keep them safe, and for direct appeals to the criminals, like with Ron Blackwell's carefully crafted message. Teresa Stoop. There's enough community interaction and information you have to release, so what you keep out even becomes more important. And knowing when you do these cases, arson cases, you're not going to have all the evidence at every scene. You're going to have to piece it together. It's not as neat as a puzzle because the pieces don't always fit precisely. So you, it's more like a mosaic, I would say, because you have broken pieces, but the focus is on solving every single crime. Anywhere where there was a fire and someone was victimized in their home, a place where, they, where they're safe, and now they no longer feel that way, is kind of what fuels our focus, is about public safety, but it's also about having all these victims feel safe in their homes again. They deserve that. 
Teresa says, traditionally, fire departments are publicly super transparent with information. But that wasn't going to work in this case. Certain details had to be kept confidential to keep the arsonist from getting a step ahead and to keep someone from replicating his methods in a copycat fire. As we're working violent crime case, a gun case or a dr drug case, there's a lot of information we don't release to the press. But the fire department, if there is a fire in a community, they're very forthcoming with everything that occurred. And bringing those two worlds together to be very purposeful and to understand that there's a level of integrity that the PIOs and the fire department felt we can't hold anything back. So we really had to make, uh, create our meetings where they wouldn't be involved and know everything. So they didn't feel that they were at odds with themselves by not, what do I censor? What do I not say? I mean, we had to preserve nuances in this case because that's how these cases are solved. We heard from Phil Proctor in our first episode. He was the one from DC Fire who helped bridge the connection of DC and Prince George's County fires. Phil says that keeping certain task force details from DC investigators was a difficult situation to be in. So that was a problem as well, because now they're, hey, what are you doing? What are you looking for? And you really couldn't, well, we were trying not to share all the pieces of the puzzle with everybody. Uh, and that was a little straining as well, because you know they're, they're trying to work their cases. And then at the same time, me, the only law enforcement officer in that group from the fire department, I recognize what we're dealing with. If nothing more than we need to have a closed lip on the specifics of the investigation. The fire department does not operate in that world, but they're getting peppered with media asking about these questions. So one, they really don't know how to respond to it. Uh, so they're looking to me to provide that information, which I'm extremely reluctant to give that information because I recognize what we're dealing with and they're not law enforcement personnel. That created a huge problem. Mitchell Canry is currently the Deputy Chief for Fire Prevention and the Fire Marshal for the District of Columbia. He has oversight over the Fire Investigation Unit. He says the kind of tension Phil Proctor described doesn't happen today. So first of all, let me say, I don't, I don't know why being law enforcement would change the nature of the information, right? The whole department wants, you know, somebody that sets a fire to be prosecuted, right? That's, that's not just a law enforcement thing. Um, you know, I work very closely with the PIO office. Uh, I'm sure Vito can attest, you know, we're, we're talking a lot of times, uh, trying to get down, you know, specifics and, and trying to strike that right balance of what we can release, um, you know, what we think will not be too specific that might, uh, you know, compromise that investigation, but at the same time, give that information that we can to the public. Um, you know, I think another part of it too, is that we try to be cognizant of is we, we really don't want to re-traumatize people that were involved. Mitchell says that arson investigations of this size don't happen very often, and lessons were learned from the DC arsonist case. Um, so I think some of the information that we learn from the case is incredibly valuable. Um, but I think what we do every day is, is also, you know, not of this kind of magnitude so often um, that it really presents some of the challenges that, that they had to deal with so many years ago. Um, you know, I'd like to think today that we're much better equipped, we're much better resourced, uh, we have much better communication, um, that if something like this, you know, were to start up again, uh, um, that we would be, you know, have much better resources, much better ability to handle it, to recognize it early on. Um, you know, we have much better relationships with regional partners and everybody else. So, um, you know, I like to think that the work that we've done, you know, since this, these incidents um, and moving forward with the department, I think we're really in a much different place than we were then. Um, so. You know, it's it's so fascinating, but I, I'm i not so sure how that, that those past events would reflect currently, you know, in the current department, right? I think it's, it's so different today. But just like fire investigations 15 years ago, working in tangent with the media is still important for the case and for keeping the public informed. 
so I mean, I think like you talked about, right? The media is is definitely necessary, and you know, I definitely view our role and our findings as really uh, important for the public. Um, you know, if we find the cause of a fire or something uh, that we can put out, and then that can help people avoid that from happening to them. You know, I think that's an important message that we are responsible to get out. Uh, in the past, you know, we the department has been more hesitant to release. Um, causes of fires and, and other things because of fear would compromise investigation um, or it could lead to, you know, other things that might uh, compromise um, prosecution. Um, you know, I think we're trying to strike that right balance where we can give um, the public all the information that we have at the same time, you know, making sure that any cases that we're building are not being compromised by, you know, putting too much information out or, or tipping somebody off that we're, we're looking for them or something else, right? So, you know, I definitely view uh, the media as an important tool for, for the department to make sure that we're getting the safety messages out there. You know, part the other part of the fire prevention division other than investigations is, is code enforcement and, you know, public education. So I kind of look at it from two sides where, you know, we need to be building the criminal cases. We need to be making sure that we can prosecute people. At the same time, there's always a public safety message that needs to go out. There's always prevention measures that we can do with every fire um, and just striking that right balance where we can get the information out to the public and try to prevent a tragedy from occurring. At the same time, you know, maintaining the integrity of all the investigations that we're doing. We hope you're enjoying this segment of Arson, brought to you by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and the International Association of Arson Investigators. If you're interested in learning more about a career in fire investigation, please visit cfitrainer.net. There you'll find over 20 profile interviews with current fire investigators in different stages of their careers, and training modules that will help you become an investigator and help you in certification as you progress in fire investigation. The National Fallen Firefighters Foundation honors the nation's fire heroes who make the ultimate sacrifice in service to others. And we need your help. Since 1992, we have been supporting fire families and departments with programs, services, and activities, including the National Fallen Firefighters Moral Weekend, survivor support programs, fire service training, and a National Memorial Park to honor fallen firefighters. We also work with the fire service community to develop and implement initiatives to reduce line of duty deaths. This is work we are passionate about and we don't do it alone. Help us help the heroes. Learn more and donate at firehero.org. So while the media had a big part to play in helping the D.C. serial arson case, Teresa Stoop says the information leaks were a detriment to their work. But the media played a really important role. We had a lot of leaks in this investigation early on, and that did not work. Okay, that did not work. <laughs> it, it no longer seemed that we finished an executive session, had another meeting, had the PIO meeting that I would leave and get back to my office, and things were out. Um, truly exacerbating and really tough for the investigators, the agents to handle, because you start to wonder, how is it getting out? Um, and to this day, has anybody figured that out yet? No, so. not certifiably. And at, at that point, you need to plug the hole. You don't need to open an investigation. Um, well, how do you plug the hole if you don't know who it is? So you have to start, it's just like a case. You start with this, the first things first. Um, I swept the building one night that nobody knew about, <laughs> except for the chief and I. Did you? Yes, yeah. we had the building swept for bugs. We did all kinds of things inside, outside. Um, and then I went and got space in a more remote location um, where you could have your war room. It could be much more open to the investigators. But the building we were in had very big windows, easy access. Uh, somebody could put a parabolic mic outside the window and probably hear some of the things we were saying. And at that point, we were not pointing any fingers. It was like, how do we solve this problem? These leaks have to stop or we're not gonna get anywhere. 
We need to be strategic in what we hold back. And sometimes I think the media doesn't understand that we use them for these educational, to, to educate the public because they're a partner in solving these crimes too. But the media was extremely helpful when leads dried up. Those Fox 5 reports shared the tip line, let viewers know about rewards, and reminded them to stay vigilant. We had press conferences to provide technical information about what was occurring. When we had a new fire, we tried to give information. Somebody out there knows these arsonists. It's our ability to educate the public so they could pick up the phone and call. Many times that's what happens. Those tips are really important. And if we don't educate the public about what we need, you're not gonna get that phone call. You may never get that phone call because they're not telling anybody. They're lighting the fire, they're taking the match, and they're leaving. So you have to take all of these pieces and these interviews and the tips and put it together. And that's why I say it's not as neat as a puzzle, but it is absolutely a solvable situation. One strategy used with the media was creating a direct appeal to the arsonist, particularly useful when leads are drying up. A carefully worded speech written by profiler Ron Tunkel and delivered by Chief Ron Blackwell that might convince the arsonist to turn himself in. Okay, so today could be that day. And what do we have today? And it's getting up and praying that if I went to bed that night, we didn't have a fire that night, no one was hurt or injured or killed. My All of my people were fine. And did we get some more evidence? We have it. Are we going to get the guy today? Um, but that type of positivity and with every great piece of evidence you get, yeah, it may have some more complications. Ron Tunkel says that since they were hinging bets that the arsonist was African-American, an older fatherly figure and black man like Ron Blackwell might be just the thing to appeal to the fire setter. So when he delivered that statement, I actually went up to him. It was funny. He just roared in and um, he had gotten a big thing of uh, something from Subway. <laughs> and a drink, and I hadn't eaten all day, and none of us had eaten all day, and he sat in his office and was wolfing from his family. <laughs> he couldn't go on TV unless he had eaten first, right? Yeah, and and so I, uh, I'm i sitting there, and I'm drooling, looking at this thing, and I thought, okay. So I said to him, okay, here's how you, I want you to say this. I want you to emphasize these words and just give them a little bit of subtle emphasis and I had actually italicized the words I wanted him to emphasize. Mm. Um, you know, um, we want this person to know. We hope he may be watching or listening to this request. We feel we understand him and, and can relate to him. And we the message to be one of understanding and not judgment. When you are interviewing a criminal suspect, criminal defendant, you have to project an air of non-judgment. Nothing you say to me is going to make me think any worse of you or is going to make you should be embarrassed about. Nothing you say to me is going to be anything you mm. And I'm not going to hold it against you. So we were trying to do that remotely. For example, we suspect his fire setting, which at first may have made him feel powerful, maybe getting out of control. He maybe didn't have the best of home lives growing up as suffering for an adult. We think this is a means to relieve stress for him. When we talk about motives, and I'm, I'm just doing a sidestep here, but you'll see why later. Right. One of the ultimate motives for arson is power. If you can distill the seven motives down, the ultimate one can be distilled down to power. And what the serial arsonists have told us in, in the research and interviews, and been borne out by my anecdotal experience, the fire setting becomes a means to obtain power, 
regain lost power and demonstrate power. And so um, we, we put that in there, that he has the power to control how things go. Mm. And then the unconscious command, we, we are going to catch it. It's that simple. And what's really best is if you come forward first. So, it ain't coming. Ron Blackwell remembers the day of the direct appeal to the arsonist. He says it wasn't just another day of doing press. Leads had dried up, and he says things weren't going well. I had a lot, a lot of respect for, for Ron Tunkel and, and what he was doing. And uh, they came and said, hey, we need to have you make a direct appeal. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what would I say? And they go, well, we got an idea. <laughs> we, we need you to read this. And uh, we want you to wear your Class A uniform. Uh, we want you to look directly into the camera as much as you can. And uh, get, get this message out. And we did that uh, press event from uh, Station 22 Tuxedo Chevrolet, and there's no longer a fire station there. I believe that it, it has since closed. But it was a, another one one of those events where there was an absolute crush of cameras and microphones. And uh, I remember being being handed the letter, uh, had a chance to read it, then I wanted some time to myself. And, you know, people were around. And I, go, hey, I, need, I need a few moments for myself. Uh, went in and went into a room. Said a little prayer. Uh, and then went out and delivered the message. Uh, and all the time hopeful that it'll get through. That he'll hear me. And I, I later learned that, yeah, he saw it. <laughs> and he heard me appeal to him and perhaps had feelings that, well, may, maybe I should. And then he convinced himself he shouldn't. And so it was done. But yeah, another very, very busy, uh, high profile day. And, you know, there, that that kind of thing had seem, seemingly the world's attention. In the summer of 2004, Ron Blackwell moved on to become fire chief of Anne Arundel, the county just down the road. When we lost Chief Blackwell, uh, moving from one department to another, but we never lost him as the face. And that was critical. It was critical that we established that, and it was a critical decision that we followed through on that. The uh, kind of support I, I was getting from Tunkel and Teresa and Brady and Bowers and Stagnero and and those guys, and you know, got got me through. But it was, I don't know. You hear, you hear people talk about surreal all, all the time. To think that I am appealing directly to him. Now, what what will that mean for the investigation? Or what what will that mean for me personally? You know, will he now try to find me and my home, my my, my property? What? What does that mean? But uh, my, my focus was, was you know, shared by, by the task force. We, we have to find the, the person responsible. And as you, you mentioned, it's big and it's about public safety. It's not about Ron Blackwell or, or in, in, any individual involved. It, it's about get, getting this thing stopped. Even after the personal appeal, the serial arsonist didn't turn himself in. You know, when we go around the country, you know, we're, we're there to tell this story, this great story. And I said, you know, the great story was only one day. It was 21 months and 29 days of failure and one day of success. But it was the process um, that we and processes that we had put in place that allowed us um, to experience that success. But success comes at a frustrating price. Tom Daly. But yeah, you had to deal with, you know, really, I mean, it was bone crushing 
um, disappointment. And, and then even when you would get a DNA hit, you know, we would be ecstatic. <laughs> and then the next day we'd say, we still don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is his DNA. What could it say? It's not in the database, you know. Let's talk about DNA a little bit. Sure. And the role that DNA plays in this. Um, so back in 2003, how prevalent was it to rely on or find DNA evidence at an arson scene? It was really, in my opinion, it was in its infancy. It was a new area of forensic science that had been be becoming more and more prevalent post 2000. Um, we knew of it. There were few labs at the time. There were few labs, enormous demand. It was expensive. Um, because there wasn't the infrastructure built to support law enforcement's use of it. You know, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous now. Um, at the time, its uh, credibility was certainly there. We loved it. Uh, we, as you know, in the recovery of some of the devices and the material used as the wick in the devices, we were able to garner uh, DNA samples and we utilized it but ATF did not have a lab ATF got a lab as a result of this case early on in the case any evidence that needed to be checked for a DNA sample was sent to a private lab called Orchid Cellmark but then in later 2004 the Montgomery County Maryland lab became available this was important because only government-funded labs could enter DNA into CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System. Managed by the FBI, it's a huge database for criminal DNA to be stored and compared. In 2021, the 20 millionth DNA profile was submitted. On Valentine's Day 2004, the arsonist lit an apartment fire on Blair Road. This fire was different because the fire setter placed his incendiary device inside the building, blocking the stairwell. This is the fire that got Montgomery County involved. Forensic specialist, Ray Cook. And this is one where, again, it, we had the 7-Eleven bag. We had a water jug this time. It was on its side. We actually saw the, the sock kind of tucked under the handle of this. And the remnants of the sock, or actually, it wasn't a sock at this time, the, the fabric. I think this was... This was the black pants, right? Yeah, the burn It was the black pants. You know, you had some of the pants that were tucked under the handle. As opposed to some of the other cases that we saw prior to this, there was an excessive mm. amount of material. But this one, there was just so much additional fabric. And it turns out this was from a pair of dress pants. Not only was it from a pair of dress pants, but it was from the waist area, pocket area of the dress pants. And those are really good areas to try to get DNA uh, from when you're talking about okay. material. And, you know, Blair Road was in Montgomery County. Now we've got Montgomery County involved. Montgomery County has a laboratory which has a DNA section. So we were able to submit these pants to Montgomery County for DNA analysis. And they were able to actually find some DNA on the pants. Yes, she, uh, Carrie Tantarski was the DNA analyst at the time in Montgomery County, and she was able to recover DNA from the pants. And this DNA from these pants on Blair Road was the same DNA profile that we saw from the hair that was recovered from Anacostia. Carrie Tantarski was a lab technician at this Montgomery County lab. I really can't overstate this. Her work was critical to solving this case. Using DNA profiles for an arson investigation was something new. In the past, no one thought DNA would survive high temperature fires. Uh, what the research ultimately showed was that until the temperature got over 800 degrees, um, really the, the DNA wasn't necessarily adversely affected. Carrie says it was remarkable how much DNA you could get from a sample. 
because the mindset had been for the most part you know that if something is in an arson scene forget about it you know don't don't bother even testing it because you're not going to get anything how do you retrieve dna in layman's terms from let's say a piece of fabric from a pair of pants right that was one of the instances uh from an arson setting yeah i'm afraid this is so plain that it might disappoint you <laughs> <laughs> Um, you simply swab the surface of the fabric. So, so say for example, if we had a sock cuff, you can determine from looking at the sock cuff what the interior of that sock cuff is. In other words, the portion that would be next to the person's leg when they're wearing the sock. Yes. Um, and then the exterior portion, which is, you know, actually if someone's putting it on, then they may leave DNA as they pull the sock up. So with uh, the sock cuff that was received, for example, from one of the scenes, you take a, it's not like a Q-tip like you would use in your house, but it's, it's basically a, a cotton tip swab. It has a long uh, handle, it's about six inches on it and the cotton on the top of it. And you moisten it with a, a special type of distilled water. Um, it's a double distilled water that's uh, free of impurities, free of any sort of DNA or RNA. And then you just literally swab it across the surface. And then that swab um, is used to go forward in the DNA testing process. And so we typically, um, in the laboratory, separate it out interior versus exterior, um, because you may get a different profile. And in particularly in this type of case, you want to, if you're trying to determine if there is a relevant profile, you want to see if you're going to see it more than once. Um, but the long and short of all that whole project was, you know, you, you should try to get DNA from a fire scene. I mean, you know, the source, like near the source of the fire in that, that experiment, uh, you know, the, the surfaces were literally charred and destroyed. And so there's, you're not going to be likely to take a sample from there anyway, because you're not going to have anything from your forensic processing of the crime scene that's going to indicate there's something of interest. Remember Ray Cook told us they recovered a hair from that incendiary device in Anacostia? The one the three boys threw into the gutter after encountering the arsonist? From the hair, it was um, from what they called Exhibit 1D1. And um, from that piece of hair, Orchid Cellmark developed what ultimately was termed ATF Arson Task Force Investigation Profile Number 1. Even more importantly, they actually had, but un unbeknownst to them, of course, the relevant D DNA profile of the arsonist. Um, and it was issued in a report, or at least the report for that work was issued by Orchid Cellmark on 20th, the 20th of October in 2003. So in reality, they had the profile early on, but it couldn't go into a DNA database. DNA was critical in solving this case. December 5th, 2005, a fire on North Bryan Street, Arlington, Virginia. Tom Daly. We had been called by Arlington County. I was an Arlington County cop. I knew that area. It was right by Henderson Hall and Headquarters Marine Corps. And Tom Polera, who was the fire marshal for Arlington County called the task force. And all we knew was that there was a gasoline soaked pair of Marine Corps pants in the middle of Bryant Street. And there was a fire in the backyard on the deck. And so there wasn't much, but we were just about to walk into a briefing that morning and Scott and I were talking. I said to Scott, pants, gas. I'll be over to collect it. Picked it up. He put them in a can or preserved them and we took them to the lab. Bingo. The DNA on the Marine Corps pants in front of Bryant Street matched the DNA from Anacostia Avenue and 30th Street. <laughs> Next time on Arson. With the DNA profile coming from a set of Marine uniform pants, the team turns to NCIS to find their man. We went to the uh, NCIS, National Criminal Investigative Service, in Southeast DC, off their headquarters. 
building in 8th and I Street. And we went in with the hopes of, were they subpoena in hand, which is why we had our U.S. Attorney's Office with us, that we were going to provide the Naval Criminal Investigative Service with a DNA profile. And they were going to then search their records for anybody in the military whose profile that comes back to. Therefore, that name would be provided to us. And so, you know, we kind of went down there, we, you know, cross bandoleros and guns blazing, you know, and, and they were like, so what's the guy's name? <laughs> we were like, we were hoping you'd tell us. <laughs> Arson is brought to you by the International Association of Arson Investigators in cooperation with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Our executive producer is Scott Stevens. Our editor is Tracy Wall. Arson is produced by Platform Media with help from Emily Vaughn and Mariah Dennis. Engineering support from Andrew Chadwick. Our theme music is by The Last Knife Fighter. And I'm Cara McGurk-Allison. <laughs>